you so much. Thank you, Janet, for that introduction. Thank you to Poets and Players for inviting me. And thank you all for coming. I'm just so honoured to be here. Um, I have loved Simeon's playing. I actually wanted to come up here and read some of my poems while that was playing, because as you'll hear, um, some of my poems also explore grief and um, the, the sort of more melancholy feelings that Simeon was talking about. So, um, yeah, who knows, maybe we can do a collaboration. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to say that I'm absolutely honoured to be reading today with um, Fred Degas and Denise Riley because their work has been um, quite influential for me, particularly Fred's, um, Fred's historic, keen historical awareness and Denise's vital writing on the complicated nature of grief and bereavement. Um, I myself lost my father at the age of seven um, when he was only 37, so I explore childhood bereavement quite a lot in my work. I'm going to start with a poem called, um, fittingly, How to Talk About Loss. And it begins, I should say, it begins with an epigraph by Raymond Antrobus which reads, because grief never leaves, it just changes shape. How to talk about loss. How? After all these years, I still don't know. Where once was language, now a lacking void of sound, touch, absence, a mouth drowned at high tide. For decades I've been a riverbed bereft, not a drop of what I was made to hold. The Thames has lessons to teach, rain and me. Forty-seven locks and weirs control the water to make the river navigable. The Thames tells me, board a narrow boat, feel the body under you, its compact weight, its liquid shape. Adrift, it's safe. Try now. Begin with facts. Say he's gone. The lock gently loosens. Water trickles. Later, say how. Say heart attack. The river flows higher, approaches the banks. Once you practice the release of jaw, the lift of tongue of air from diaphragm. It gets easier, <coughs> like a lock frequently turned fends off rust. But careful now, a lock can snap. And if it does, the whole damn river will arrive at once. The next poem is called Guzzle Say, and as the title suggests, it's written in the form of a guzzle, which is an ancient form which has historically been used for um, writings about longing and loss. Um, there are, the poem includes quotations from an essay by Noir al sadir called The Map of Four Kisses, and in addition, this poem is in conversation with a poem written by Will Harris, which is also called Say. Guzzle Say. There is no definable point at which a living organism dies, scientists say. It shakes me to read words I've been striving all these years to find, to say. The universe is rarely ordered 
in binary ways. How to articulate this basic and profound truth my mind struggles to believe, let alone say. All I know is you've been gone these long years and at the same time, you haven't. You've been right here. Though till now, it's not something I thought I could say. Dead and alive are terms whose meanings are wholly psychological. Physiochemically, they merge into one another. They bleed, you could say. Bleed the way my knee did, releasing its dark stain. Running too fast to meet you, I fall. And what was once inside me, now on your hands, your blue shirt. Sorry, I say. You pull me close. In the garden beside the alley in which we crouch, the chestnut trees are whispering, a sound only half got out. Sorry, you say. The whispering grows louder, reverberates in my ear, my throat. Father and poet, tell me honestly, what are you, what am I trying to say? As well as exploring personal loss and um, growth as well, um, I was also interested in exploring intergenerational trauma, how loss and grief are carried down through the generations. And the next poem I'm going to read is a short poem which begins to explore these questions. It's called On Sound. They say no sound is ever lost, that every wail Heel of laughter, bullet burst. Every curse, prayer, oath, every water skin, pebble roll, snail shell crush, reverberates indefinitely at a frequency our ears cannot touch. But the body hears. So as a person of mixed heritage who grew up estranged from my paternal Indian relatives and who came to develop a warm relationship with them as I grew older, which is explored in the work, I had and have many gaps. Um, both in my knowledge of my own family history and also of Anglo-Indian history, which was compounded by the fact that, as we know, Britain likes to gloss over and evade its colonial history, and only more recently have the less positive aspects of the British Empire begun to be um, discussed and more widely acknowledged, thankfully. Um, so the next... Better late than never. <laughs> the next poem is set in Lucknow, in India, at a site called the Residency, which is one of many sites, but one of the primary sites of the first war of Indian independence. It's called the Residency, Lucknow. The morning you visit the Residency, the April sun is already high and intolerable a brightness blearing the information plaques. Crumbling walls pierced with exit wounds. There is no guide to talk you through who <coughs> owned and lived in which derelict pile or lead you to the museum which you discover on return to England is a highlight. 
only your cousin and husband, both dehydrated, and the children who must be kept out of the sun as much as possible. This is impossible. You almost give up, sitting in shade of a tree with a name you don't know, in front of another ruin, history unforthcoming, a legend written in script you can't read. You want to understand this, want and at the same time don't want to know the truth about what happened here. <coughs> the hurt inflicted on your ancestors, on both sides, from both sides. This is your inheritance, or at least a part. You are here now, living, breathing, question mark. couple more poems. Um, thank you for listening so quietly and attentively. The next poem, I thought by this point we might all want a slightly more joyful poem. <laughs> and there aren't many in this book, but there are one or two. Um, one that focuses more on connection and resilience. Um, the next poem shifts in place and time as well as tone um, to Jamaica which is where my husband is from and is where we met 18 years ago. It's called Blue Mountain. We had passed halfway point. Every muscle in my body was singing, brimming with lactic acid. We'd been arguing, arguing as we climbed, about the best way to climb a mountain. <laughs> See, my husband's there laughing. Climbing about the best, the, arguing about the best way to climb a mountain, though I had never climbed a mountain before. And you had topped the summit countless times. I wanted to enjoy the walk, the winding path fringed with unfurling ferns and bamboo stalks gold and tall. You said, to get to the top, you've got to look up, kept leading us off the path to the shortcuts through the underbrush over rocks and red soil. Impossible to gain stable footing, we kept on moving, the forward motion propelling us a step ahead of stumbling. It started to rain. You took my hand. The air thickened with the scent of parched earth being pummeled by water. Particles of dust darting up, resisting their muddy fate. And already I was drenched. Had never been so wet. I'd never been so close to the clouds with the rain coming down and kept on going. At the summit we stood, hearts swollen with victory and relief, though thick grey mist had stolen the famous view of the north and south coasts of the island. Later, in the guest house in the valley, you tell me of the Taino and Maroons who escaped slavery by fleeing to the Blue and John Crow Mountains. It was here, in unmapped land, colonists dared not enter, that they gathered, grew strength, and planned their resistance. to time or potentially even gone over a little bit. So I will end there. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>